Welcome back to Beyond Recovery, everybody. My name is Matt, and I am welcoming back to the show. That's the first time I can actually say that, welcoming back to the show. The first guest that has come back twice. So nice we had her twice. Caitlin. How's it going, Caitlin? Good, good. Thank you for having me back. I'm excited yes. to be back. How are you? Very good, thanks. Yeah, good. no, totally. We were... Uh, had a little bit of preamble as as we often do before we get uh, started so that was pretty cool some uh some neat news on your end that we cannot negation acknowledge cannot quite disclose yet but very very cool yes um yeah and then we're working on a song together based on one of your poems which i think is turning out quite uh, quite wonderfully as well and yes it's a full moon so we did a full moon event last night full moon open mic so you know a lot to talk about um yeah. you know what let's we as well start there. We we so we started you and I. We have started a um, an Instagram page, a community called Creative Recovery. So it's at Creative Dot Recovery on Instagram, and it's all about uh, it's like art therapy, music therapy for those in sobriety, and it could be early sobriety. It could be and we're not discriminatory in that sense. <laughs> so um, yeah, and really cool. So we did a, our first ever uh, full moon open mic last night as it was the full moon uh the hunter moon as it was disclosed uh false advertising though it mentioned it was going to be a pumpkin moon this orange moon I, I i was going to ask if it was down your way you actually messaged me and said i'm not seeing any kind of orange hue i'm like mm. i same here but yeah it was regular full moon color <laughs> yeah. over here so right right so <laughs> But that's okay. That was it. Was still great. It was still a, a wonderful full moon, and it yeah. Was. So it had a really cool open mic. So we're going to be doing that, and just yeah, encouraging anybody that does photography, culinary arts, martial arts, uh, really any uh, drawing, coloring, uh, singing karaoke, singer songwriter, music of any form, just really anything's on the table that's artistic and it's a more abstract. Um, you know, way of you expressing some of these traumas, feelings, uh, you know, that are p perhaps uh, trapped inside of you. So I think it was a really cool idea. What has been your, uh, I guess, experience with creative recovery so far and just creativity in general? Yeah, I mean, creativity has become something that's very, very important um, in my life, especially in sobriety, um, just as a place to, like you said, like the creative outlet um, has been huge. And then, um, just something, you know, to do and something to keep my mind busy or, um, you know, I, I'm definitely, um, we've talked about this, but I am an overthinker and sometimes my mind will do, um, I'll, I describe it as a ping pong ball feeling where it's just bouncing from one thing to the next. And, um, the focus is really difficult for me to get on one task. I'll be doing something, thinking about the next thing or the other thing, or the past thing, um, and and uh, creativity has really become a way to recenter myself. Whether it's my coloring books, um, writing poetry is a big one for me. Um, singing has become um, a big one for me now that we've worked through the fear, um, which has been awesome. Um, I'm singing until I lose my voice now. Some days, just like over and over, and I look down. Two hours have gone by, and I'm still singing, and I'm like. Oh, that's new. Um, so that's, that's awesome. Yeah. It's been, it's been amazing. And it's just something that was always there. Like I think back to like being a kid and I was definitely creative and colorful and, um, that I definitely had that side of me and I lost it for a little while. So to get that back has been a really beautiful part of my story. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about that just in general. Like I found it such so often the case and you know i brought it up on the show a few times but worth worth uh reiterating is so you know children i would say always i dare say always uh, you know binary talk <laughs> acknowledged yeah have a creative side using their imaginations their love and coloring they can you know make a castle out of a cardboard box you know and some newspapers you know they lego like all these different things that really you know when you're up to like five six seven eight somewhere in there like you're yeah. you have this powerful imagination and it's somewhere along the line you you know uh, 
I've been told, or perhaps you were told, and you know, we'll get into that story if if you care to tell it. Uh, you know that you know, you're singing at the dinner table, and you know a dad or or your mom or something's like, oh, you can't sing, like stop stop singing, okay? You know, and it's just like boom, that's where it ends. You know, yeah. it's like whereas with like uh, so that's like creative uh, endeavors, right? Or you, your painting sucks, or you're not a poet, or anything like that, right? And then boom, done, never try it again. Or do or very like very self conscious about it with that ringing in your head. Oh, I'm not a singer. Why am I even trying? Right? Versus like sporting. If you're a, if you're a basketball player and you kind of suck right away, your dad's like, you know what? We'll get you some lessons. We'll take you to some basketball camps, right? And all of a sudden, you're miraculously you're good at uh, basketball, right? So it's curious to me that we support you know support uh, the children through. Um, you know, through support uh, sporting events as such versus uh, with creativity, which has been actually proven to have the similar health benefits that, uh, you know, athletics have have for both mentally and physically. Uh, yet it gets so dismissive of just like, oh, no, you can never sing or you can never paint again or don't be don't try writing and things of that nature. So it's interesting. So how did that was that the case in your life? Like, were you shut down or did you have that perception of being shut down as far as creativity? There, there was a perception definitely from my side and, um, it was more, you know, I can look back at it and see that it was a story that I created. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're, they're the statement that I remember is you're so cute. It doesn't even matter that you can't sing. Um, yeah. Oh. And, you know, and that's something that like, when you're saying it in the moment, it, it, I'm sure there wasn't a, a thought twice that I was going to remember that at 32 years old, you know, like, right. so, um, so yeah. And like, I was in piano lessons and, um, I did that for a while. Like, so I can look back and be like, okay, like I wasn't necessarily shut down on that side. I just don't know if I was fully understood in where I wanted to be and where like, you know, like the singing, I think was looked at because I wrote songs as a, as a little girl, like I would, mm. you know, like, what I don't remember many of them and whether they were, you know, as good as whatever I was eight. So, right. Um, right. Right. <laughs> so I would write my own songs and I would sing them and I would sing them like an eight year old girl that hadn't been trained on any sort of singing. So um, they probably sounded like an eight year old girl who hadn't been trained on any type of singing and was trying to write her own songs. And um I definitely had like a, a passion for it. Um, like as I look back now and, and look at it and I just don't know if that was really even seen at the time. So like, I think my passion for it is really where the like feeling shut down came from. Mm. Because if I wasn't so into it, would that comment have really stuck with me? Like, oh, this is something I really wanted to do and I can't do it. Yeah, um, so, yeah. and that's, so that's a big thing for me, but yeah, I definitely see that too. And it's like, you know, I think a lot of it is like, if you're not this like child prodigy at music, like then you're never going to make it in music or something like along those lines where like yeah. that perception is. And for me, it wasn't so much about like being some big star someday. Like I didn't think of that far into it. It was just like in the moment I really enjoyed it. So it was disappointing when I would feel shut down or like I remember like I would want to like sing my songs and just like the reaction of like oh here we go again or like that kind of thing like I would uh, it, and so now it's like when I want to sing for people I just like I'm automatically like oh they're they don't want to hear me sing you know like that's like the first thought in my head or right. so yeah definitely can relate to what you're saying yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know, there's a worth mentioning, like the the redemptive tale, like you mentioned of the uh, the the singing or the perception that you, you can't sing, and it's you shelved it for years. And uh, you know, at the risk of being uh, what is it, self self grandizing or or whatever it may be. I mean, it's cool. We you, so you and I ended up doing a song together, uh, mm -hmm. where we essentially did a duet. Right. And it's available on, uh, you know, this is where the, the self plugging comes in, but yeah. it is, it's worth, it's worth uh, mentioning because the song turned out beautifully yeah. and it's, it was, it's really cool. It's really neat that, that we got to do this together. So basically it was like a, a three minute, not even maybe two and a half minute song that I had in the middle of a sound journey, uh, that, you know, per, 
resonated with you because the content was very much of the the coaching uh, experience that you and I have both been through with and lifted. And, uh, and yeah, I said, well, why don't you hear, why don't you start, uh, you know, practicing this one? You p- p- pretty much got the lyrics, like you nailed them right away. I didn't even have to send you a lyric sheet, you know, and before you know it, you have the, the melody down and we we're able to record, uh, long distance. You just recorded, uh, in such a way on your phone that you can send it to me. And then I lined it up, you know, as you gave me a count, count in kind of thing. And boom, there we go. We have our first single, you know, we've made a few bucks on it, by the way. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's available and we have it posted in our coaching community and, and it's cool. It's just one to me, this is like one of these things that's like, I love about creativity and, and the, the, the ability to prove not necessarily yourself wrong, an old version of yourself wrong or an old version of yourself, right. If you want to look at it as a, a more powerful way. So yeah. I'm really proud of you for putting the work in A and B, being able to shelf that old limiting belief story, you know, acknowledging it, but putting it up on the shelf and going, okay, I got it from here. Right. So yeah, I love how it that was, turned out. Yeah. It was really cool too. Well, that whole experience was like, uh, like as I kept going, it was like, yeah, like there, there's, there is an old version of me in there that's saying like, you can't do this and you're scared and this and that. And there's also an old version of me in there. That's like, this is amazing. This is what we've always wanted to do. Like, this is so cool. So like, it's, it's just like, who are you going to choose to listen to? Which old version of yourself are you going to choose to listen to? The one that helps you expand and helps you grow or the one that shuts you down? Yes. Yeah. No, very well put. You know, we talk about that a lot. I think, if you can get down to, you know, when we're talking a lot of times, there's a lot of gray area. There's the acknowledgement of like, there's a spectrum to everything, to the polarities. Uh, but, but at the same token, I always like to use, you know, one of a mutual, uh, like mentor of our Kyle Cease goes, if it's, there is the binary, okay. You're either expanding or you're contracting. And that's what I've been putting a lot of my uh experience my life experience through recently and just it is nice to have something that's super simple like that where there is okay it's either this or it's that right Mm -hmm. because otherwise yeah there is so you can get kind of trapped in the nuance and and in the uh you know the granular you know uh spectrum otherwise so uh, yeah i love the the use of the word expansion and love how you brought this up now yeah definitely so one other thing too is like you know we're, we're really and you did a a wonderful post on this in creative recovery on the Instagram is, you know, just really, I'm hoping in just the discussion that we're having to start this, this episode off Mm -hmm. is, you know, there, there will be other people out there listening going, wow, you know, that's great for Caitlin, but like, I, I just, I don't have an art, I don't have creativity in in my blood or in my body. And that's, it's so, again, that's, I, I, and I challenge anybody that says that that's an old story. If you remember yourself as a child, guaranteed there was some imagination imagination is creativity or very very close uh close cousins or neighbors or something right um mm-hmm. so that was what we were really trying to encourage so you know and that could be just if you enjoy something that's like photography or anything it's it, i i um you know i challenge challenge you to to think differently about it right mm-hmm. and um you know i think there what was the one that you posted i'm gonna put you on the spot but it was like something about like creative and then each letter has some kind of uh you know tie into it and i I thought it was really well done yeah Um, so that's on Uh, there yep that's on there and yeah and what you were saying i just wanted to point out too like that thing that you liked when you were a child like really look back because like it may not be singing like, but you mentioned culinary arts in the beginning. Like, did you want to be a chef? What did you want? Like, what did you want to do? Cause like that for me, is like that whole, like lighting your soul on fire feeling, um, do the thing that lights your soul on fire. And that's for the most part, those are the things I love doing as an inner child or as a child that my inner child loves doing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And one thing that I want to, to circle back to as well, as you're mentioning, and I think a lot of people will be able to relate to this as well, that this whole idea of like the ping pong ball, the task jumping that has become so much of a everyone, seemingly everybody's uh, lifestyle, right? As far as, uh, you know, working with like eight tabs open and you got your cell phone going off and yada, yada. So you have found something coloring and like you say, singing, you mentioned two hours go by just like this and mm-hmm. that's what you're doing. That's what you're immersed in. So coloring, like coloring books is a way that you can really get present and focused 
you can, uh, you know, the, I imagine it's really helpful for your breathing and such, and really brings you back to like that monotasking, the one focusing on one thing. Right. And I'm wondering yeah. if that then sort of echoes through the rest of your day, does that sort of bring everything down and, you know, parasympathetic that breathing. And then when you do go back to, uh, your work tasks, does that give some more clarity and more linear, you know, uh, monotasking type feel, or do you find that you snap back into the task jumping? No, for, it does. It helps a lot. Um, and just doing it, it's, it's coloring for me is, is similar to meditation where like, if I do it 10 minutes a day, um, it's better than waiting until I'm stressed out and doing it for 30. Uh, um, like yeah, yeah. more like maintenance. Um, mm. the, what, when I find myself, you know, like sitting down for two hours and coloring, I'm like, okay, I, I let myself get out of balance or whatever it is. But yes, definitely like that mono, that one task. And then the other thing with coloring is also like when I sit down and I'm out of focus, I'll start just like coloring big chunks of the page in the same color instead of like the tiny details yeah. um, where like the tiny details are where the magic is like putting like that, that much thought and that much creativity into it. Um, and then I pulled up that, that post that you were talking about. Yeah, so yeah, it was please. courage, resilience, everything, abundance, trust, intuition, virtue, and expansion. So those words spell mm. out creative. Yeah. Um, Amazing. Yes. But um, yes, coloring, singing. And I mean, I liked to color as a kid. And that was another thing, like coloring outside the lines. Like I definitely got that a lot where it was like, oh, you're so like, you color outside the lines and this and that. And so like, I stopped doing that. And these things that I've come back to help with my focus, help with my happiness, help with my breathing. Um, I, they do definitely have a physical like effect on me. Um, one, because I'm not, you know, like it, I stopped drinking and I started coloring, which is huge. And then same thing with food where it's like, oh, like I'm going to have a snack. No, I'm going to go get my coloring book. Cause like that, like bored eating or emotional eating or bored drinking or emotional drinking are now replaced with board coloring or emotional coloring or board mm. singing or emotional singing, which is like what I want to do. What like fixes that boredom? What actually makes it better? Mm. Mm. I love you said they hung on the word better, which happens to be the name of the song. <laughs> if you're, if anybody's looking for <laughs> that, that wasn't planned, I swear. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. So perfect. Yeah. So perfect. Yeah. I, uh, you know what I, I, okay. I, I a quick segue into something. Yeah. Uh, I want to run by you and we're, I'm kind of having the feel of this conversation of a similar, similar nature as well is I always, I, I've always viewed that like art and like music and just anything really reflects life. Like you've mentioned, you know, your ability to, to like emotional color, emo, um, things of that nature. So I find that even conversations reflect, um, you know, uh, or, or vice versa, like a, a musical jam session with somebody reflects a conversation right so i had a great conversation with this uh guy from inlifted uh community matt gallo uh, a couple days ago and it very much felt like he's a musician as well it very much felt like we were having this uh the conversation happened in movements as if it were classical music and we we're kind of planting seeds throughout the conversation and they'd come up later on as if it's like a repetitive piece of music like but each time it came up it had a little bit more like grandeur behind it i was like man this conversation really feels like a piece of and then he kind of he clued in or like it resonated with him and then we were, had used that as the framework and then we we're kind of okay now this is the part where you know the climax and then we had this yeah so it was really neat and, and uh, so i've always viewed art to reflect life vice versa you know um I'm kind of feeling that in, in this one too. We, we, we had a, a loose framework before we started. And then other than that, you know, like the thing, the, the little thing there where you said better, I'm like, okay, now we can circle back to the song that you and I had yeah. done. So things of that nature. I just, I love that, um, you know, the more the right, I guess it's the right brain thinking, right? So uh, I'm, I'm curious for you because you, like, as you've mentioned the last, you know, three, four months specifically have been really feeling a lot more creative for you. How has it been for, you know, what otherwise perhaps was getting an overworked, the analytical side of your brain, like at work and such, right? And logic and so forth. And then there's almost this dormant right-hand side of your brain. And now you've got this whole brain thinking going on. Uh, how's that helped alleviate anything on the left-hand side? Like, have you found yourself more 
creative in the analytical side of things or does it like relieve some of the what perhaps would have been like a little bit overbearing on that uh you know the work side of of things with you or do you get what i mean like if the like yeah the left brain was just doing a lot and then there was kind of dormant on the right hand side if you will yeah i'm glad you brought this up because i, I wouldn't have connected these things um and or maybe i would have it just would have taken me longer um <laughs> but yeah like just like the the creative side like conversations flow differently like like you were saying and it's like instead of forcing myself into like this conversation because I feel like I should or into doing something because I feel like I should, like it's much more just like living in that flow or talking in that flow or joining a conversation that I want to join and sitting back in a conversation that I want to stay out of. Um, so definitely. And, and yeah, I mean, I can picture conversations where it's like, I'm talking in color, you know, or like that kind of thing. Like, it's hard to explain what I mean by that, but like, yeah. it's just like, it just like, is like coloring a page, the conversation. Um, and it's a lot easier to have those conversations when you have somebody on the other side of it, who is also like coloring their own page. And then mm. you're just creating this like art in the form of a conversation together. So yeah, I definitely, definitely yeah. hear what you're talking about. there. Oh, super cool. I love that. Yeah, it reminds it. So yeah, the way that you mentioned is like, okay, so before I would, you would potentially like, not butt in, but you would say something, you feel the need to be a little more assertive, perhaps than what your mm -hmm. normal character would otherwise, you know, portray, which to me is like, if you're in music, and say we're playing, and, uh, you know, I got like a rhythm going on, and then you play really loudly to kind of, or like in the group, mm -hmm. it's almost like interruptive, which I've played with a lot of players that are like that their personality is how they bring in the music. So that it's like the guy that's loud a loud drunk you know and we're jamming he's the guy that's got full-on distortion just hitting the chords sure. completely oblivious to the rest of us playing quieter and we're just like it's so you know what i mean it's just kind of funny how you're um the way that you approach you know creative endeavors is so much your personality in just a more abstract way which is really neat so yeah. cool yeah i like i like your uh yeah, your analogy of like, you know, conversation is like coloring and, and yeah, exactly. Like shading it in the words are like the nuances of the way that you're coloring, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm going to put this color down and pick up a new color, but it's yeah. like just for this different spot, it's just as beautiful and yeah. it's going to make the whole piece come together better. Yeah. Um, and I need to take a second to decide which color I'm going to use. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Uh, you know, a couple of things uh, before we get off the subject of, of creativity, certainly yeah. this could be the, the full podcast and we oh, have yeah. some other things we want to get onto, um, <laughs> you know, is um, the, you know, the, the whole idea of creative recovery too, or one of the, the, the key pillar ideas, if you will, is just for me, like expressing myself, I always felt like I had to have alcohol or drugs to, and that was tapping into the real me. And I, it was the tortured artist thing that I, I was modeled for me. You know, I was reading all the, the rock bios growing up. I thought Led Zeppelin getting hammered ass drunk and tearing apart a hotel room after a show was so cool, right? You know, mm -hmm. I'm 18 years old. Of course, that's cool. I like to break things like when, you know, when I was that young. Right. I, mean, I still kind of like to break things in a much more controlled environment, but you get what I mean. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, just the idea that this, like the tortured artist thing or you need, I needed alcohol to feel my feelings and to open myself up to be able to write this song and just or, or the karaoke thing i really want this to catch on the sober karaoke and I'm, we are getting some comments on some of the things that i'm posting like oh i'm not quite there yet like it's mm -hmm. it's the uh oh i sing karaoke but i need about four or five drinks first <laughs> mm -hmm. you know it's like that whole thing and just just eliminating that like you don't know you don't need drinks negation acknowledged mm -hmm. Uh, to do it and it's just and so finding that comfortability with your creative side without this see this a bizarre illusionary need to tap into your the true self with like drugs or alcohol so um yeah I guess more of an observation I, I'd like you to chime in about the just the weirdness the strangeness of drugs and alcohol and creative endeavors you know like right from the the, the bands and like er, the Ernest Hemingway fantasy of him you know, t with a typewriter at the bar with a scotch or whatever, right? And just eliminating all that. Yeah. Well, it's ironic because tone deaf and can't sing were 
the two things that I remembered in my head about singing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I would, I would sing karaoke after drinking all the time. What, and I would be tone deaf and I couldn't sing Uh, when I was drinking. So it's like, it was coming true, you know, like, um, like, and the only time that I would do it was when I was in that state. So it's just, it's very interesting that like, (sighs) that was a thing. And, um, I will say that even though I thought I could sing when I was drinking, um, drinking took my creativity. Like I let drinking for me numb the, it was supposed to numb the bad. That's what I thought. Like it was numbing the bad. It was quieting the voice. It was stopping that ping pong ball effect. Um, and while it was doing that, it was numbing out the good too. It was, um, creativity. Like I, I lost really any like care even when I was singing the karaoke it was like yeah I'm doing this like funny or like a joke or I would get up and I would just sing ridiculously or like that kind of thing like I was almost like making a mockery out of the things that I loved and Mm. um just like completely losing sight of that I loved those things and wanted to like take them seriously and I I was making them a joke instead um which is funny that I said that because when I was drinking I was instead of taking myself seriously, also making myself a joke. So um, that's interesting. Um, So yeah, it was just very much like that, like for me, numbing it, silencing it, losing it, like just losing sight of really anything that I wanted because it was easier than wanting it and not getting it, if that makes sense. It totally does, yeah. Yeah. And it is, it's strange. That's why I was doing a lot of air quotes uh, about, you know, like the initial relationship with alcohol feels so much like, oh, I finally know how to, I'm no, no longer shy. You know, I'm like, I can finally like sing in front of people and all this. And then very quickly it turns into what you just explained where it's almost, uh, it, like you said, well, I'm not almost, it was, it's almost like a mockery of, you know, this thing that you do desperately actually do want to be able to do, but then you layer it with like a substance and then this like ironic humor, dark humor attached to it. And it's, yeah, even though deep inside the, your inner child does want to be able to do it and be taken seriously with it. And, but it's just right. beneath all these layers of, you know, dissonance and, and whatever else and is numbness going on. And numbness and silence and, and yeah. 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 And it's like, I, I liken it to, you know, if you, if you're not taking it too seriously or you're kind of doing it a little bit like ironically sloppy or whatever, that's a way that you don't have to worry about being like made fun of or something. Cause you're almost, you're beating it to the punch, beating them to the punch. Like, oh, I'm not taking it that seriously either. So you, you know, it's almost like another layer of like protection that you're putting on top of it. And yeah. And I also with karaoke, like I would sing sad songs and I used to say that like my voice sounded sad like my singing voice sounded sad so I I could only sing sad songs and like um you actually put up a post and asked what's your favorite karaoke song and I was like they're all either really sad or about drinking so like I am gonna work on finding a new one yeah like (laughs) Vice by Miranda Lambert was a big one and it just Mm. like pretty much repeats the line the only thing that I know how to find is another vice um and I'm like I can't sing that anymore like you know I negation acknowledged so yeah. um yeah so it's just very interesting that like I would sing these and you know that could have been in itself like a, a crying out of myself and you know like this like I'm sad like yeah. so it's, it's just very very interesting to look at that from an authentic I'm gonna use that authentic word mm. um standpoint where it's like what I was doing that was quote-unquote creative when I was drinking was completely inauthentic and um not like in line with what I actually wanted it to be. Yeah. 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 I get you. I get you. I, I found I, I did that with songs as well as finding ones that m- tapped into a feeling that I wanted to signal to people that I was feeling. So like, yeah. and then if they asked me about it, like, no, no, it's not actually how I feel. No, no. Right. But you know what I mean? So it's, it's just the, hurt confused chaos that came along with with over overindulgence right right uh, but I, I totally get you um i also find that lyrics now have so much different meaning now that i've grown out of all these well not all these but a lot of these old stories right like um i think kyle had pointed kyle cease had pointed out how <laughs> a lot of love songs are actually like codependency songs they aren't like 
genuine love. It's like, I can't live without you. And like, yeah. don't, don't leave me. And, uh, you know, it, it's like, you know, that's been since the beginning of time, like blues music is all about, you know, about can't not being able to live without somebody or, or, uh, I yeah. want you back and, and uh, I'm, I'll change. And, you know, a lot of codependency type stuff. So it's, uh, it's funny. And like so many, I remember Mark, one of our, you know, our, Mark England, our, 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 uh, mentor as well, uh, it pointed out a Kelly Clarkson song that was just like, just negations. Like the whole song was like victim mentality negations. And he's like, mm -hmm. you see me there talking like Mark, like doing the voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, it was just so like funny. that. That was good. It was, it was so funny, <laughs> you know? Uh, so yeah, it's interesting too. Like looking, looking back on even the music I used to like, it's so nostalgic for me. So there'll always be that charge. Uh, but man, the lyrics are not necessarily something I, uh, I can relate to anymore. In fact, they kind of lower my vibration, this angry music that I used to listen to, you know? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a moody playlist and then this one that I, someone else's playlist, but I, I stumbled upon it on Spotify and it's called pretty girl magic. And it's just mm. like all about like, you know, like high energy and changing yourself and transforming. And it's like, you know, like I'll put the moody one on and I'm like, this is just making my mood like tank that right. much more. So then I'll like switch it and I'm like, oh, now I'm, you know, good. And it's, it's, it's so funny. Cause like, I think back to being like eight years old and singing porn by Natalie and Brulia and it was eight mm. and it's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm alone and broken on the floor. And like, yeah. what is an eight year old singing? Like, of yeah. course, like you're going to grow up and yeah. So yeah. It's just, it's, it's interesting. And, and it's, it's interesting, like you said, to listen to it now. And it's like, it still will lower my vibration if I'm not aware. But mm. Sometimes I listen to it with an awareness and like, I'm smiling and like singing it like a happy person. And it's like, yeah. this is, it's so interesting to like break those patterns with them too. So. Definitely. Yeah. The yeah. awareness is key as with, yeah. as with everything. Most, yeah. most yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> For sure. So, and, and I realize you know, when I'm listening to Nirvana, now you know it's even though it's like it's such a tragic story and a lot of his music was a cry for help in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um there still is like to your point as like i have the awareness like i'm listening to it as like to have this nostalgic charge of you know of uh, man i love this album and i still do like there's still elements that just really resonate with me right i grew up with this cassette and played it to death so having that right. awareness that, that the connection is with that versus the uh the other content that being the lyrics and <laughs> what ultimately happened to him right so yeah. yeah yeah super cool super cool well uh you know we got into a little bit into we're talking stories and we mentioned uh you know victim mentality showing up in songs and all that you recently drafted up an amazing blog that you know we'll see what what comes of it but uh is the uh and it's literally on the victim mentality it's i think it's my from my Perfect. victim to to my hero yeah you got yeah it. that's mm -hmm. yeah it's it's amazing so it ended up um showing up uh, as content in my uh my online course that i have on the victim mentality lesson and you've posted it in our uh recovery roadmap uh, group that we have and yeah i thought it's just amazing work and uh you know let's just talk a little bit about that because you know it's for folks let's just get into like the victim mentality because i don't know how much i've actually talked about it on my podcast yeah and um before i let you take the reins i just want to make the differentiation like if people are hearing it it's not you know i don't use negations because just it's easier to describe it. it's not a, the fact that you have been victimized it's not you know necessarily saying like if these people are off the hook now and you just have to pretend like it's never happened it's it it is acknowledgement that there has been times in your life that have you've been you know, victimized, it's just removing that victimization echoing through the rest of your life and creating these patterns and triggers. And, and that's how what you're living your life experiences through this idea that things are out to get you, right? So this, and which is that becomes the victim mentality. So I want to make that, you know, that point of differentiation right away. But other than that, I'll like you, let you, uh, you know, take the reins on this one, like how, how the victim mentality was and showed up in your life and then how you became your own hero. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I am going to make this a book. Um, I sent it cool. to my brother and um, said, yeah, I'm going to write a book. He was like, going to write a book or are writing a book? And I was like, okay, I'm writing a book because I already have the introduction. So, yeah. Um, and yes, my story of um, being a victim, I mean, now looking back and the conversation we just had likely started 
you know, a very long time ago and was perpetuated by the music I listened to at eight years old. Um, so <laughs> I um, definitely grew up with an anxious personality. Um, and I mean, I can talk about like stories that I don't even remember in my childhood. Like I used to get so upset that I would cry and then somebody would like come up and either console me or scold me because I was doing something wrong and I would cry harder and then I would pass out. Um, so I would just cry until I passed out and then I would wake up a few seconds later. Um, but it was like, I would just get so upset. I like couldn't handle it. Um, and then there's stories of me in like first grade and teachers like nicely correcting my behavior. Um, and I would just lose it. Like there's, there's one time that I was stamping on my desk and, um, the teacher said, Caitlin, we don't stamp on our desks. And I just cried until my mom had to come pick me up. Um, and these are stories that I don't remember. So like, it's, it's easy for me to say like, yes, those stories are stories that I can change now because I'm definitely aware of them and the root of them. I'm still unsure of what that is. Mm. Um, and then I went through high school, um, and definitely just like tried to be invisible. I would talk to myself horribly. Um, just like you're dumb, you're not pretty, you're this, you're that, like, like I would never have talked to another person. Um, and all the time I'm growing up and people are telling me that I'm sweet and I'm a good girl. And I'm amazing and this and that, but I'm, I'm telling myself the exact opposite. So, I mean, what you're saying to yourself is way more charged than what other people are saying to you. Like I can only run on people's compliments for so long. So, um, so yeah, so I went through high school and then my senior year, I was working in a restaurant. Um, we talked about this a little bit on episode one, so I'll breeze through it real quick. Um, but I was working in a restaurant and we, um, it was just really easy to drink and to get alcohol and alcohol was super accessible. Um, so I started, that's where I started to really learn that alcohol quieted that voice in my head and, um, you know, numbed out that, that anxious feeling that I walked around with since I was a child. Um, and then, um, went to college for pretty much just continued that cycle um, and I was also, um, very much, pretty much since 13, trying to like diet and exercise the whole time as well. So I'm going on these yo-yo diets throughout this whole time. Um, and then doing all these things that were counteractive for making me feel better, um, and helping me and doing them with the idea that they were going to help me all the while still talking to myself in the same way that I had been talking to myself. Mm. So I was making myself this like victim of yes, there were things that happened. And I took those things and made them my life, my identity. And I made myself, I started looking at those bad things. And then it was so much easier to like, look at the bad things and give myself excuses and like not take responsibility for the good or the bad in my life. And then drinking started to like numb all that. And it just got really fuzzy and confusing. And I just kept telling myself that like, I deserve these things. I went, I go through a lot. I do a lot. I'm a good person. So it's okay. Um, and then in, um, well in 2018, I met my now husband and, um, this is where like the shift started to happen. Um, because I started in the beginning of our relationship, just like running on his love and his compliments. And, um, I was, what I thought was happy until it wasn't anymore. And like, we were happy and like, let mm. me clear that up. Um, mm -hmm. but it was just like, I couldn't run on his compliments, favorite person in the world. But until I started giving myself that love, I was never going to feel that love. Like for me, self-love is the source of all other loves. Um, that's a big thing that I say now. Um, so I, we got engaged and then we started planning our wedding um, this was December of 2019. So, um, the pandemic hit in March and I pretty much had the whole wedding planned. Um, we, I bought a dress, I picked a venue, we had a date. Um, so we were, we were all set. All the vendors were booked. Um, so we're going through and, you know, everyone's like, oh, well by September, everything should be good. Um, you know, now looking back, hindsight's 2020. Mm. Um, and no pun intended there. And um, <laughs> no, <that was> good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so 
uh, our what our big wedding got postponed. We got married in my parents' backyard. It was great. It was amazing. Um, I talked about this a little bit on episode one too, but it all goes mm. goes hand in hand. So I'm gonna just just um refresh the memory there. Mm. And so we got married in my parents' backyard. It was a big party. Um, and then I just continued partying and like I was still in that place of wedding planning because we had postponed the big party so I knew that it was going to be like another year of it and I was just giving myself all these excuses of like I went through a lot I am working full-time I'm doing this I'm doing that like um I deserve to to drink the wine or to order food out because I just don't have time to like do things and I'm stressed out and I, I want to relax and um and the quote from from the little story that I wrote is I said all this to myself as I opened a bottle of wine at 3.30 in the afternoon and ordered takeout for dinner. Mm. Um, so I was giving myself all of these excuses and just living as the victim of of me. Um, because yeah. in reality, it was all the things that I was saying inside my head. Mm. So um, then in December of 2020, uh, we went out for the girls' night. Also, I think I mentioned this. Um, and... I ended up in the hospital um, because I had uh, made comments that deemed me a danger to myself. So um, that was what I thought was the worst night of my life. Like my biggest mistake. Um, I was just in this terrible place. Um, so I came out of that though. And I look back on it now and that was the shift. That was like the best thing that could happen. That was my wake up call. That was the universe being like, all right, it's time to get yourself together. So um, I entered coaching. Uh, shout out to my brother, Chase, who texted me and said, you want a story work coach? It's not me. Um, and uh, uh, so I started working with Mark England, um, who's the founder of Unlifted, and uh, just learned a lot about myself and a lot about the fact that, yes, things has ha happened to me. Yes, I had gone through a lot. Um, and I was using that to stay stuck and I was using it as an excuse to not take responsibility for anything that happened in my life. I was using that as an excuse to not move forward in my life, um, and just to not take control of my life at all. And, um, that was a lot of negations. I learned to do all those things to take control of my life, mm -hmm. to move forward with my life, to start looking at things as opportunities. So that's, the, that's the, the thing that's different is that my life is not a negation of knowledge. Perfect. Now uh -huh. it is. I look at the good. Whereas before I looked only for the bad, like what went wrong? Um, what wasn't I able to do? What did these people do to me? Like what, what did I go through where now I'm like, what can I do? What can I learn? What do I see? What's beautiful? Um, you know, and I look for those good. I look in the mirror and I tell myself that I'm my friend. Um, I start talking to my, I, in the, among so many other things, all the things that I used to say terrible to myself, I now flip and say the good. So I'm smart. I'm brilliant. I'm beautiful. I'm amazing. Um, I'm my friend. I'm mine. You know, like I take ownership for my own life. So, mm. um, yeah. And that's, that's the biggest thing is like taking that ownership and, live as your hero. I mean, look for the good, live as your hero, realize that life will happen. And the way you react to it determines your happiness, determines your state of mind. So. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Very well put. So it's a uh, great. Uh, yeah. Like you said, refresh, you know, the story. So that's essentially what was the, the, the blog post. And I'm really glad that you're going to do the, uh, the book as well. And, you know, there was a, a lot of, I remember you had you mentioned you read my book and there's so many mm -hmm. similarities and I felt very similar. I remember getting emotional and reading yours. I'm like, man, and, you know, there's, I, I think there is, there's certain broad stroke similarities to a, a lot of addiction recovery stories, but mm -hmm. there's like actual like nuances and timelines that mm -hmm. are pretty similar, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and yours and mine. So I think that's why we have such a, you know, a special connection, right? There's like a lot of uh, experiences that we share, you know, as, yeah. as we've grown up, which is really neat. So yeah, I love that. So coming soon, um, you know, really looking forward to that. You have a, a great way of writing and, um, you know, the message is amazing. You know, when I'm hearing you talk about the victim mentality and, 
and so forth. One of the other things that really comes up from like it's the uh, you know so it goes hand in hand with victimality is these like justifications and entitlement, right? It's like because this hap happened to me, I get to react in this way, and it's like matching that energy with that same kind of energy. So you've perceived this thing that's victimized you, a life circumstance or a person, and as a result, I feel entitled to match that energy. Well, well, f you. If this gets, then I get to, you know, what I mean, which is only mm -hmm. harming myself further, right? It's right. not like it's not like this. Like, okay, well, eye for an eye. If this happens to me, then I get to go eat some junk food. Then, you know what I mean? It's right. this weird, like justification system that that har like harmonizes very strangely with with uh, with a victim story versus the opposite of of that realizing, okay, this has happened. I can now make the choice to act out of like a hero story. And as a result, uh, I'm going to start making choices that do align with myself. Like you've made uh, uh, leaps and bounds with like the way you approach food and the way that you uh, enjoy preparing it. Whereas you, before you didn't necessarily uh, enjoy that. Right. So, and then that, that is just the way you level it up is you, you flip it on the other side of the coin you know what I mean? And, and focus on, on the good, the good. And, and then you're going to make, instead of justification stories, uh, it's going to be, I don't know what the opposite of justification would be. Well, how would you, it's, it's, it feels more free, right? Justification yeah. feels like it's this reactionary thing. Whereas, you know, um, when you're making, uh, it's like a choice. It's, it has a freedom and a lightness to it. Right. Uh, how would you describe it? Yeah, absolutely. And like, yeah, a, a freedom, a lightness, clarity. Mm. Um, and I talk about, I talked about this in the, in the in progress book too. Um, I had the food, I had the alcohol, I had the talking bad to myself. And those were all things that I had come become dependent on. Yes. But none of those were my addiction. Those were mm. symptoms of my addiction to the victim mentality. Uh. So those were ways that I was coping or attempting to cope with my victim mentality, the things that I was saying to myself, the things that I thought I went through, um, the, the mental chatter, like I was trying to stop that with the food, with the alcohol, with, yeah, with talking to myself, um, that kind of thing. Like I was, so when you start to live as your hero, that just, those things fall away. Like the, the dependency on them falls away. So yes, free is a great word because you're no longer dependent on all of those symptoms or all of those coping mechanisms. So free space, clarity, ownership, mm. um, responsible, any of those. There's something so it's, it's, it's unusual. Like I, I would, I used to shy away from ownership. I enjoy. I thought I liked having that ambiguity and not necessarily being a little bit fearful of being a hundred percent accountable and a hundred percent responsible for everything that happened in my life. I liked a little bit of gray area with that. Mm -hmm. However, as I've grown up and especially over the last three and a half years of alcohol free myself here, uh, I've found that it's, it's so much more empowering and, uh, it's not frightening and I can respond rather than react when I know what I have, you know, control over. And it's, it's a lot less than, um, you know, trying to micromanage every avenue of my life. So it's, uh, yeah, that's, I guess it's worth noting. It's, it, you know, and the projections to reflections thing where it's like, ah, uh, that this person made me feel, and then realizing it's, no, it's something inside me that's getting triggered. It's not that person, right? Unless I'm actually in a fight or flight state, if, like right. somebody's literally about to start a fight with me. Right. Anything that anybody says to me is actually coming from within me based on right. something else that happened to me. Right. So knowing that you can take responsibility and man, it, that was one of kind of surprising to me. I, I thought I wanted a buffer zone of not having a hundred percent accountability or responsibility with my life. And then as, as soon as I'm moving towards that now, I feel so much better. And like, I feel more, more in control now. Whereas before I, I had this perception that leaving a little bit of gray area would, would, would make me feel more in control. In fact, it was the opposite. Yeah. And I, I, I believe that the, um, the reticular activating system has a lot to do with this for me, at least because I started looking at the good. So I started seeing the good. So like, I wasn't so afraid anymore of the bad. 
So right. like I could take that ownership and that accountability because yeah. if the bad happened, it was like, yeah, it's, it's like not so soul crushing to me. Like before, if I used to mess up or that kind of thing, like I wanted to push that away. I didn't want that to be my fault. I was terrified of it. And now it's like, I can take that ownership because one, I see it a whole lot less. It's, mm. I'm not telling myself that I mess up every single day, multiple times a day. Right. Um, and I look at when I mess up or when I fail or whatever, I would have used to say their lessons there. It's, it's a way to propel. I mean, I'm telling my hospital story is like the shift, the, the best thing that could have happened in that yes. moment. Yeah. So like when you start to look at those things that way, it's like, they're not, like I said, soul crushing is the best word I can use that. That would have been like my most soul crushing rock bottom story. And now I can look at it and be like, that was life changing and amazing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll get into stories here. I have one thing I wanted to circle back to what you said, but you know, I, I had a, a gentleman on my podcast a couple of days ago and uh, he said something that really, it bit been on the tip of my tongue, but I hadn't heard it articulated as such. He said, you know, the comeback story is, you know, I, 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 right up there with like hero's journey of something that just everybody loves a comeback story. You know what I mean? Rocky. Mm -hmm. It's in so many movies. It's like mm -hmm. when somebody is at the absolute bottom of like their experience and then all of a sudden it's like okay you've hit there so there's literally no other way to go up but up and then watching this here the per person become their own hero right so when right. you're talking about the shift there you know it's, it's either you stay down there and you just that's that was kind of end of the line for you or you have a comeback story and comeback stories are just in you know, the hero's journey that whole thing man that everything about that is like, boom, that's like my juice. Like anything about that, it just gets me goosebumpy feeling. So uh, super cool. So we're talking stories. <laughs> One of the other things you mentioned is like, uh, you said I, the things that I thought I went through. And I love how you said it because like, let's face it, a lot of our memories get very skewed. And if we have like a story from 12 year old Matt, it's going to be um, a, it's that's a long time ago. I won't age myself, but let's say it's a few years ago. <laughs> And my memory of a 12 year old and the story and the emotion that I attach to something is gonna be very skewed and then throw in another 30 years of me rehashing that story. And it's not even gonna be correct, right? So it's like this mm -hmm. incorrect story based on a immature version of me that I've just been clinging on to that's echoed throughout my entire life and has created all these patterns. And the story as I told it didn't actually really happen, right? There's maybe elements of truth, but me trying to cope with it i layered on all this this, this emotional charge in order mm -hmm. for me to whatever not feel as bad about myself not feel as bad about what the way i was parented so like no no my parents didn't mean you know what i mean things of this mm -hmm. nature and then there's this like you know gap between the actual objective truth and then the you know layers of yeah. <laughs> bs that i yeah. put on top of it plus all the years of like you know the fisherman story the fish is this large all yep. of a sudden it's this big right so all of this so i love how you worded it i don't know if you remember even saying it but i wrote it down as soon as he said yeah. it. the things i thought i went through so yeah. it's yeah cool what do you like yeah the stories the story work but for sure really, and yeah. yeah and that and then another thing with drinking was I would, I would talk about those stories with people when I would be drinking, like anybody that would listen, like the things that I thought I went through. Um, and I would get reinforcement in that, you know, like people would be like, Oh yeah, that's so messed up. Or like, right. Oh yeah. Like, I can't, that's so sad that like you went through that, like, you know, different things, like you should call that person out or what, what did you do? Or this is the reason that women don't speak up or whatever it was. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, and I would only talk about it when I was drinking. So I know it was always like made to be worse than it was one yeah. and two, it, it was like this in again, inauthentic trauma bonding thing mm. that like really didn't solve anything because half the time I didn't remember it anyways, like talking about it. Um, so yeah, right. yeah. So it just, it, it, and then I, you know, that person would remember whatever, and they would, you know, then like perpetuate it and make me feel like I really was the victim. And like trauma bonding is a huge, huge thing too. And I, I did it with other people. Like I would, yeah. we would trauma bond. And like, it was like, it was a way that I created friendships. And like, it's the same thing with the, with the love music where it's like this attachment and like, I need this person and they know too much and, or know what a lot. And, um, they're just, they're there for me. And so I'm so attached and there's, there's just so much that like goes into 
that too and like perpetuating your victim mentality like I wasn't one of the people that wouldn't talk about the things that happened I I would talk about them and I would let people reinforce the fact that I was a victim yeah right I know what you mean though too it's like where people there are certain people that are just seemingly just salivating to hear something negative because then it's just like permission for them like if you if, if I just remember the, the the place I used to work if I came in just in like super high vibe there would be certain people that would just like kind of turn a blind eye or really not really pay attention to me and then if there was like a time where I just like ah you know I'd show some like body language of like then they'd just perk up and they're like oh you know, like Matt is, I knew he would come down. You know what I mean? If this felt yeah. like they were just ready for you to say something negative and then, then all of a sudden they just light up, which is yeah. so, so strange to me, but yeah. you know, it's a, uh, I, I know what you mean with well, the whole reinforcement thing and, and I guess mis- the whole misery love company, um, which is, I mean, I, the, the flip side of that is, uh, you know, positivity loves, loves company and loves collaboration, I guess would, would yeah. be my translation of the positive side of it. Yeah. And yeah. And once you start, holding that energy you find people that match that energy for sure yeah definitely definitely so you know and we're talking stories we're talking like your your experiences uh you know and all that and now you're at the stage you know here we are a few months removed from the first interview and you it was it's just at the beginnings of okay i'm looking at uh at uh, doing some coaching myself now i've done all this extra work you know oh, not extra work but i've done all this deep work on myself so you're kind of you're at the tail end of your initial that first leg of your hero's journey where you've learned all this different stuff you're circling back now and you yourself are creating a coaching program for people you just did uh your first webinar which was very successful like fall uh oh i'm gonna get the name wrong but it was on the fall first day in love of- with your life yes, yes. fall in love yep. with your life yep. and now you're developing a coaching program it's a 21 day immersive program 21 days to a clear-headed you you know, just tell us, tell us a little bit about that. You know, like what are, what are the plans for that? What is the 21 day transformation that you foresee people going through? And yeah, just tell us all about it. Yeah. So I based it off the 2190 rule. Mm. Um, so 21 days to create a habit, 90 days to create a lifestyle. So um, the idea is to get you to that full 21 days to have the habit um, going into the holidays. So I'm shooting for December 1st, mm. um, saying that publicly. I don't know if you could hear that, that hesitation, but we're, <laughs> we're shooting for December 1st. Yes. Um, and the idea is going to be to set an intention on the first day. And then through the 21 days, you're going to check in and tell us, um, tell the group what you're doing that day to help perpetuate your you towards your goal. We're going to have weekly calls, Um, And then I'm going to do a coaching call with everybody in the program. And then I am designing a course that's going to go through a lot of like the inner work that, um, that I've done personally. um, And that's really helped me. So uh, yeah, the idea is to get you to choose whatever your intention is. And then to kind of have like this community and this journey together, take out the kind of, I just Mm. heard that I did that, Um, the (laughs) community together and um and you're also going to be working on your one individual goal. So, um, yeah, that's the idea. And it's Very in cool. the early stages of de- development and it's going to be great. So, yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I've always admired your ability to, uh, correct your, um, or course correct your, uh, your verbiage, whether it's like the soft talk or the, uh, you know, like you say, there's he- some hesitancy or like negations and such. Um, I find it, it's, it, easy for me to do when I'm doing like text messages and emails. And that's where I always recommend people start. So if people are listening to us and hearing us doing like a negation, acknowledge and soft talk knowledge and all that, um, you know, it, realize that it is an ongoing thing and the aware, again, well, where we'll circle back to awareness is key. Right. And it's, um, you know, that would be my just like little pro tip would be uh, start with your emails, start with your text messages and, and just really, okay, am I being ambiguous here? Am I being clear? Am I being solid? Am I being positive? It's, it's an easy way f- to start. And then as you can see, you and listen to Caitlin uh, with her, with her own, uh, her own speech, basically just correcting course, correcting in real time, which is really cool. <laughs> that also, um, I'm going to shout out Chase again. Um, yeah. yeah, I have my older brother who is very good at it, who, um, 
you know, call, we call each other out. He just yeah. gets to call me out a little bit more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> He's, it's funny. Cause I listened to your guys podcast, his shout out chase and, and primal man pathway podcast. I was a guest and you were, and then you were a guest uh, shortly thereafter. And I loved listening to you too, because it was a different dynamic, obviously like brother, sister. Right. And he's uh, so, yeah, he did a lot of that, like either be a pause and be like, do you, did you say this or do you mean this? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. not too often though. You, you were, you did a great job on that, on the show. So shout out to that one. Definitely worth checking Thanks. out. Thanks. Yeah. And just like really cool. I love the idea of the, the program. There's a lot of thought put into it. There's like the opportunity to collaborate, whereas also do your own personalized journey on the way there. Obviously, the twenty one ninety rule is something that you and I have, have batted around just like in our in our casual conversations as well. There's something there for sure. So I love that. Uh, yeah, really excited to, and perfect timing for, you know, in the holiday season, um, heading into holidays. And then, of course, January 1st is like, you know, seemingly 80% of the population is like, okay, hey, time to change my life. New right? year, so, new me. Yeah, new yeah. year, new me, right? So <laughs> yeah. it's going to be right hand in hand with that. So yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. I love it. I'm really proud of everything you got going on. You've been on a lot of podcasts. I want to say, was it, were, was it your first one? Was my, was Beyond Recovery? First, first alcohol free podcast. Right. Second yes. podcast ever. Second, yes. Right. Okay. Very yeah. cool. And you've done uh, quite a few since then. And just everyone that you're doing is just like, man, your, your game is, you're just up in your game. It's just, I love Thank listening you. to love yeah just love listening to you like honestly and then not blowing smoke just because you're on the on the show I, I think you've done a great job of just everything like uh, i've just yeah very much uh enjoyed uh seeing everything come to fruition for you so thank you you know you bet thank you one of the uh the key things i remember uh we're talking about when we first started talking and i would say this is in spring of this year was this balance like recalibrating yourself, finding about like a, a, tr a, pr a true balance, right? Because there was a lot of ups and downs. And then of course, navigating that beginning of sobriety, alcohol free life, there is going to be a little bit of uh, up and down as well. Extremes, uh, just that's the nature of it. Thawing out, there's no more numbing, right? So there is going to be these highs and lows. So now getting into the, you know, the, the, some of the conversations you've had, I've really enjoyed talking about just, you got your polarities, and uh, we may perhaps call the pendulum swing too. Like for example, I'll use it with you, not to put words in your mouth, but the, the, the shy, quiet child and then and finding your voice. So you've gone all the way across and you've very much found your own voice. And now it's kind of like you're finding uh, the, where the balance is and getting comfortable with the fact that, no, no, it's, it's, it's okay to still have that quiet, you know, uh, you don't have to, have the pendulum swing and just be like, okay, now I'm going to talk. And everywhere I go, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows what's on my mind. And right. then just relaxing back into where this new balanced, normal, you know, normal, you know what I mean? Uh, the equanimity uh, yeah. between the two. Right. And, and, and that's just uh, the example that comes up, but I'm sure it's showing up in other spots in your life as well. Correct. Yeah. I mean, with that example, just to put like, a time or times to it. Like, yeah, like I, when I have an opinion, when people are talking about, you know, themselves and healing and that kind of thing, like I can join that conversation and I can talk about it and I can be very like conversational. And then when somebody is talking about some sort of like political conversation, I can be very quiet and um, sit back and I don't always have to have an opinion. Like if, mm -hmm. if there's something that's going on, that's an opinion in a conversation and I don't necessarily feel a certain type of way about it. I can sit and listen and be that shy kid and breathe well so that I can, mm. you know, my breath kind of helps every pick up kind of my breath helps everybody um, stay more equal than, than they would. And, mm. um, and I can get up and walk away um, if I want to like yeah. It, you. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's another thing that we talked about. And another example with this um, is that the word authentic um, can also have a balance because um what is authentic to you in one situation may not be authentic to you in another situation. Like I'm going to stick with this example for a second where I, when I started using my voice, I was like, Oh, what's authentic to me is using my voice. Like, like I've been quiet and timid and muffled, but what's authentic to me is using my voice. But in that same political argument situation, what's authentic to me is sitting quietly because mm. I, I, that's a conversation that I would rather not join. Yes. So, um, so yeah, the, the 
authentic balance, balance and authenticity, however you want to put it. Um, and then, yeah, there's, there's so many different examples. Um, I mean, the big one too, is like right now, like the creative and then the like work side. Mm. Um, that's another one that I've been finding more balance with. Um, whereas before it seems like I was, I was an extreme person before, like it was like this or that, um, good or bad. Um, Mm. so yeah, the, the, um, coloring while also like putting in work in my full-time job and my coaching course and all of that. And just like really finding that like cohesiveness in there, um, has been big for me. And then, um, I mean, food is another one where like it was good or it was bad. It was healthy. It was unhealthy. I was gaining weight or I was losing weight when I ate it. Like it was, I had a very toxic relationship with that. Now it's like, you know, like I'm going to eat what I authentically want. And most of the times that's food that I would have called healthy because I'm listening to my body, but sometimes I eat ice cream and I eat chocolate and I eat fried whatever, because like authentically that's what I want. And like, you know, now I'm in tune with my body and I'm like, Oh, well now I have a stomach ache. So I like, it's more like what I feel instead of what I'm just telling myself in my brain of these like restrictive rules. Yeah. 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 You know, it's something that just came up for me that I'm thinking of. And I want to just spitball with you on it. It's like the mm-hmm. idea is so authentic and I'm, I'm going to get to the, what you're, to summarize, summarize like what your definition of authenticity is nowadays. And I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's like a living, living thing. It changes with us. It changes with me. My I, idea of authenticity will change as my core values may, right. As, as mm-hmm. I've refined them and it's not like I'm going to go way far out to left field and it's going to be completely different, but there's going to be variations as I grow as a person, right? And we're talking about the, uh, there's extremes, there's the yes or no, there's the, uh, but the allowance of, of, you know, gray area and like nuance and development and expansion, so forth will the, uh, you know, the idea of like what authenticity means to me and realizing that it was before I was kind of confused. I'm like, well, how, you know, like what you talked about, I'm like, how can I be authentic you know, uh, in a family situation where I'm talking differently to, you know, my brother, as I would, if I was, you know, talking to somebody at the grocery store, right. That I just met. And it's just like realizing, yeah, there's some, like, it just, it's a living, breathing word for me anyways. So, but the one thing that really came up for me was the, um, the idea that authenticity, you, you can't have like judgment involved. So like, for example, like the whole idea of, when I'm relaxing now, I used to judge myself and be like, ah, I'm having a lazy day. It was like derogatory, right? Mm-hmm. And realizing, no, like I'm having, a, I've made in a conscious decision to have a relaxed day so I can recharge uh, because I'm feeling burnt out, right? Uh, so as soon as there's like judgment is involved, it's really hard to be authentic because the judgment, like who's the judger and why am I judging? because of I'm comparing myself to somebody or because I'm comparing myself to what, you know, I'm supposed to be doing. It's like the egoic, you know what I mean? Uh, the egoic needs or egoic commentary comes in. So yeah, what is, I, I guess just like the topic of like authenticity, what it means to you and how can you be uh, authentic, like judgment free? Do judgments still come up and cloud your ability to be authentic? Yeah. Um... I believe that there will be moments of the judgment for a very long time. Um, and, um, and they're less and less. And the more and more that I learn that being authentic to myself in the moment, um, and that means that I feel connected, that I'm breathing well, that I'm, um, listening to what I believe and what I want. And that to me, um, I mean, I put a post about this last week is right now the, I'll say biggest thing that I'm working on is like this people pleaser past in me and like always often wanting to do what other people want me to do or not even really thinking about what I want to do because 
there's other people to think about. Um, mm. There's other people involved. Like I was so wrapped up in what other people wanted and what other people thought and other people's approval that like I back burnered my own approval for life pretty much. Mm. Um, so that's what it is to me is like, do I approve of what I'm doing? Mm. Do I like what I'm doing? Um, am I in this place that I want to be? Is my, are my head and my heart in agreement right now? Um, those are those are big things, and those may be amb- ambiguous. Am- how do I ambiguous? Yeah. <laughs> Where's that word? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, ambiguous uh, right now because I'm still like really figuring those out in my head, and I feel so much closer. I am so much closer to it with like than I was when I was saying that using my voice was authentic. Or I was making it so like, you have to be this way to be authentic. And that was like putting, I mean, that was conditional. So right, right. yeah. So just letting, being like living in that flow of like, like really riding the waves instead of like just crashing into them, you know, like, mm. yeah, there's, it's, it's very interesting. Like, and it's, it's a, it's difficult to define. And I like that you ask it because it's negation and knowledge, not always the same thing. Right. Right. I love how you're focusing more on how I'm feeling in the moment with it versus the, uh, well, it's got to be this. Like, yeah, conditional authenticity, uh, it, it was the same as you know, as judgmental authenticity. Like, well, in comparison to this, then I'm being authentic. You know what I mean? That right. shouldn't even come. All that phrasing is just like bonkers. Like, it really has, yeah. So it's, it's, it's cool. It's cool how you mentioned it and just the idea that it can change and it's it's allowed to change you know uh moment to moment depending on so i guess for me like when you're talking about and you said there's some degree of ambiguity to it when you're saying you know it's it's how i if it's passing my test the way i'm feeling energetically and so forth like if it's truly a 10 or or something along those lines however you want to verbalize it um Having said that, so would that be based on, for me, when I hear that, I'm like, okay, so that is definitely based on either the expansion first, expansion, or are you contracting one of the two? The one sort of thing that we've agreed upon that can be can remain binary. Or for me, it's like my four core values. So if I, if I, if they are attached or, or, you know, overlap onto all four of them, great. So that would be for me, it's like, okay, am I, am I present? Am, am, is it keeping me present? Uh, am I allowing, is there like a co-creation with the universe or am I micromanaging? So am I allowing, um, is, is it a healthy decision? So mentally, physically, body, body, spirit, is it healthy? Is it aligned with my, my overall, uh, health that way? And, uh, am I curious about it? So am I, and that would, I guess that one ties specifically into like, am curious to me, curiosity is the ultimate expansion because it curiosity can overtake fear fear can get pushed aside if you're curious enough about something right that's yeah. where the excitement replaces fear so that would be an expansive thought versus uh am i locking up am i contracting am i fearful so those are my four core values today right could change yeah. by the next time we talk uh so if if my experience is going through those for or they connect with that in some fashion and i feel an overall expansive you know uh feeling or energetic uh center in my body then i'm being authentic so yeah i'm just i guess just riffing like what what i'm curious like what do you have uh do you have certain core values that you're like boom like these are my you know three or four or two or six you know hmm um not like that not like written out specific and that's like i'm listening to and i'm like hmm. and it's very similar to a pirate code um mm, yeah yes, yeah so and which i i started to write like last year um which that would be interesting to find what i wrote then um, because there that would definitely be transformed but yeah i mean being i think listening to I would have to go with listening, not have to. I want to go with listening to my inner child because that's been Mm. huge for me lately. Like, is this what the little version of me would want? Is a is probably take out probably is number one um, Mm. that's coming up right now. Mm -hmm. Um, 
does this make me feel good? So that likely goes along with health. Um, yeah. And is this leading with love would be a big one too. Cause that's a cool. huge one for me is like being love forward. And I can feel that's, that's actually a good one. Um, because I can feel very much when I'm like being ego forward instead of just like being love, very love forward. So sure. Or we've even talked about like the perception of like an obligation, right. With social situations, which I think is a very common topic amongst people that are recovering, right. Where mm -hmm. they have a group of friends or even family members that have this expectation of the party version of, you know, the old, the quote unquote oh, yeah. the old version, right. Of yourself, um, you know, or of, of myself. Right. So, uh, you know, being able to navigate that as well. No, I love, yeah. I love that. I love that. All three of those, those are really great filters and they definitely are. Thank you for asking good. that question. Yeah. Very consistent. Yeah. You're very consistent with those. So thanks. Yeah, rad, rad. And it's, so self love is the source of all loves. That is your, uh, one of your mantras or affirmations these days. Yeah. That's uh, a big one. Yeah. So self love, this will be my final question for you. Aside from the, mm -hmm. where can we find you question? The sure. final question of the interview. Yeah. So self love, the source of all loves, um, yeah, what, uh, I guess more just what can you say about like the, that quote, the, the self-love part, um, how important, how much, how prior, how much of a priority is that in a time where you do have overlap of like you're starting your own business, you have, um, you know, some, you know, it's a, we'll just say something, it's like a, 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 a curious time for you at your, at your other job. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of things going on in your life. Uh, you're still in that uh, that first year of sobriety. You still got some holidays to go through and all that, which I remember mm -hmm. what that's like. So a lot going on for you. So what is your relationship with yourself, with self-love? And how is that sort of shown up in this journey that you're on? And how much of a priority is it this day, uh, these days when there is all that you know, potential background noise that used to attract your attention, uh, very, you know, feverishly. The background noise makes it more of a priority. <laughs> um, oh, cool. Yeah. yeah it's, it's the priority. Um, because yeah, I mean, self-love is really, I'd say like 80% of it all right now. Um, yeah, cool. yeah. And it's, it's in the form of, um, and shout out Matt, because he called me out on this the other day where I said everything. Um, and uh, it's in the form of telling myself that like I'm in these situations for a purpose and a reason. And whether that's helping the other people who are in that situation or what it is, like that is still myself. And, um, you know, it's there's situations that I'm in that aren't technically like coaching and then they're that's exactly what they are. So, mm. um, and when I prioritize my self love, all other love is effortless. It's ah. like, because I'm like lighting it up and really concentrating on it from the inside. So it just kind of like exudes, take out the kind of like it exudes mm -hmm. out of me. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so it, it, for me, it's like, rather than trying to like build this love to give to this person and build this love to give to this person and, or this job or this job. Like if I just make that a priority, I go for walks every morning, um, except this morning, but that's okay. because I'm going to go tonight. Um, and, <laughs> um, so I go for walks every morning. I, you know, I look at the trees changing. I color, I take that time to like do the things that I want to do. And I can be, you know, I can like not have time to color and I'm, like, I'm going and sitting down for 10 minutes and I'm coloring like that because whatever I do after this is I'm going to be able to get more done. If I take that 10 minutes, from it's the same as meditation. Um, I'm going to be able to get more done if I take that time for myself, like that slow down to speed up. And that is, it, I mean, it's all of that is self-love because it's taking care of myself first instead of just pouring myself out, which I did for a long time. Yeah. Um, just like tried to pour from that empty cup or, you know, just like refill it just enough to pour to the next person. And then I completely empty myself where now it's like, just keep the cup full. You can pour out a little bit and then it's like two seconds to refill it or one meditation or one coloring session to refill it back up. And it just takes so much like less where it's like, I'm just 
walking around as love. I don't need to like give so much to myself or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. I love the, any, anything to do with the whole slow down to speed up thing is so resonating with me these days. You know, I, um, I have this idea that I, it's like, yeah, how to word this. It's one of these, like, I got to correct myself in real time. I'm out of the stage. You know, I, 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 I'm finding I use the, I feel like to kind of buffer mm -hmm. so I don't come across braggadocious. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've, I, I've yeah. often used soft talk so I don't feel like I'm braggadocious, but I, whatever, I've done the work. So I'm going to, I'm going to say it. I'm out of the stage where I feel the need to be on this like constant grind of seven days a week and like, oh, like. But, uh, I worked 70 hours this week and, and things yeah. of that nature. I'm, I'm beyond that now, uh, you know, and it's, um, and that's based on the, the type of, you know, thinking and embodiment that you're talking about is taking more time for myself versus, tr yeah, fragmentedly trying to uh, appease these other external expectations, right? And as a result, I, when I show up, I'm so much more efficient at these other types of things. And then I can take more time for myself. And then I'm just finding this a way more uh, sustainable um, and uh, like just less glamorizing this whole idea of this grind and like, uh, got to get ahead of the person and being in this uh, kind of like illusion of competition with, with people. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. I get a little bit competitive with myself to a degree. And even that I'm, I'm growing out of as well. But you know, there's it's, if you if you truly have a growth and abundance mindset, there there is no competition. You know, there's yeah. there's this there's collaboration. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, I, I love what you're saying. It's like it, I was asked once. It was actually by Kyle. The last coaching call I had with him, he's like, we we talked about some tangible things, some objective goals. He's like, okay, so I'm gonna leave you with this. What do you have to do to become the type of person that can attract that? to happen to you. I was like, Ooh, and that's yeah. literally what I've been going on now. The sort yeah. of intangible, the subjective life experience type stuff that will, if I'm working on myself in that certain way, the results are like, the results used to be at the top of my, you know, priority list. Mm -hmm. And I was working and working and doing that. And now that's like at the bottom and right. that sounds, that sounds counterintuitive because it kind of is right. But it's like, if I'm doing everything else, what happens is if I'm doing the work on myself and showing up as I want to, the results are the byproduct of that. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. And I think that's, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but I, I get the impression you and self love and your relationship with that is exactly that. Yeah. Super cool. Super cool. There was one other thing that came up. I completely forgot what it is though. So, <laughs> and you know what, we're, uh, we're already, uh, this is an epic episode. This might be our long, the longest one, um, that I've had as well. So it's, which is amazing. We've had so many great topics. Yeah. We we'll always love having you on. Um, yeah. we could definitely do a, uh, you know, an ongoing, uh, mini series, you know, once a month or every six weeks, have you on and just, uh, just kind of just riff on things. I love it. So all for um, that. Yeah, totally. Totally. So yeah. Where can people find you? You know, like I, I imagine from the first time they've listened to you to now, it's like, Oh my goodness. Like this person's got a lot going on now. So where can we find you and get a hold of you? Yeah. Um, still the, uh, at clearheaded underscore Caitlin, um, on Instagram is the best way. Um, I also have clearheaded.me, which is my website. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, there's a contact me form there too. So that'll go straight to my email. Um, those are the best two places to find me. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Caitlin Micah. So you can message me there too. Um, that is, that's, those are, that's, and then creative.recovery. I'm in there too. So you can find yeah. me any of those yeah. places. Awesome. Caitlin, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's always, always a pleasure talking to you, collaborating with you very much, uh, you know, uh, enjoy our friendship and relationship. And it's, uh, feel like we're like, you know, uh, old friends, even though we've only really known each other for a, like a half a year, which is crazy. Yeah, so it is uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah. So super cool. I really appreciate you and really proud of you. And, uh, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you. Same to you. And thank you. Thank you.